For Telesur, I'm Reagan Devines in Caracas, Venezuela. Thank you so much for joining us. Welcome to our morning news program. Our top story takes us to Argentina, where the leftist ruling party Front for Victory scored a huge electoral victory this Sunday. Its presidential candidate, Daniel Scioli, had secured over 38% of the votes after 90% of the votes were counted. His closest rival was Buenos Aires Mayor Mauricio Macri with 22% of the ballots. Scioli told the news conference that he would continue progressive social programs instituted by Fernandez's regime because they've taken the country in the right direction. All is now set for the presidential elections scheduled for October 25th. With this backing, this support, this victory, this result is overwhelming. See what you see, but the only truth is reality. And the reality is that we have at least this huge difference with our circumstantial adversaries. We continue in Mexico, where activists, journalists and the public, gen the public in general have expressed dissatisfaction with the way investigations are being carried out in the massacre of the photojournalist Ruben Espinosa, activist Nadia Vera, and three other women. Now, police are suggesting it was just a robbery despite Espinosa's and Vera's revelations of being threatened by the government of the state of Veracruz. Possibly in a move armed o uh, aimed only at quelling criticism, Mexico City prosecutors will travel to Veracruz to take testimony from Governor Javier Duarte. Veracruz is statistically Mexico's most dangerous place to be a journalist, and the country has been recorded as the second most dangerous country in the world after Iraq to practice the profession. I have given instructions to the Attorney General's office in this capital so that tomorrow the Deputy Prosecutor for Investigations goes with a team of public ministers and secretaries in order to coordinate with the Veracruz Attorney General to obtain this statement relating to the facts that were gathered directly from the governor. The violent Mexican state of Guerrero is once again in many headlines and as the Ayotzinapa families begin a hunger strike in their long quest for justice, 20 more people have been reported forcibly disappeared. Among the victims are women and children. Witnesses told reporters that municipal police and an offshoot of the ruling party called the Antorcha Campesina participated in the abductions. Just a few days ago, 15 people were killed in Guerrero, just miles away from where the Ayotzinapa students were disappeared. Among the victims was activist Miguel Angel Jimenez, who was leading a search group for 300 disappeared people. And still in Mexico, the energy minister, Pedro Joaquin Coldwell, denied a WikiLeaks re uh, report which have re revealed that Hillary Clinton participated in Mexico's energy reform when she was the U.S. Secretary of State. According to the emails disclosed by WikiLeaks, she led a series of actions to promote the privat privatization of Mexico's energy industry. Coldwell assured this was completely absurd and said the energy reform of President Enrique Peña Nieto is 100% made in Mexico. Uh, to Peru now, where two suspected commanders of the armed guerrilla group, the Shining Path, were captured in the south of the country. Police transferred the two rebel leaders to the Peruvian capital, Lima. They were identified as Alexander Alarcón Soto, also known as Comrade Renan, and Diosio Ramos, also known as Comrade Yuri, after the capture of their top leader, Abimael Guzman, in 1992. The rebels decreased their activity significantly. Officials hailed the recent arrests but said victory cannot be declared as yet. This leaves the shining paths, the guerrilla of the south in the Cusco region, completely undone. It is an energy hub, a touristic hub which is well safeguarded. This can't be taken away. But we are not triumphalists. Six people, have, six people have died in Chile and over 830 more evacuated from their flooded homes. The heavy rains also caused mudslides in the central and northern regions of Chile. The three deaths took place in Tocopilla, where there are about 110,000 people living without electricity across the country. 9,100 of them are without drinking water. The government has warned that the weather pattern is set to continue. 
In Honduras, our correspondent Gerardo Torres has the story after the first meeting with the representation of the OOS that is proposing a dialogue in the country in which very few have expressed hope. The Organization of American States, OAS, has attended the call-up from Durham President Juan Hernandez, who has been proposing a dialogue to try to stop the political crisis he is currently facing. Rixi Moncada has been designed by the opposition Libre Party to face the dialogue, but she assures that before sitting with the government, the latter needs to accept three demands that will put it against the wall. To face so many acts of corruption that we have denounced, and in answering the demands of the youth and in general the Honduran society, we have put as a first condition the creation in Honduras of an anti-impunity and anti-corruption commission that would be very similar to the one in Guatemala. The second thing is the demand to cancel or whatever mechanism needed to invalidate the illegal sentence ruled by the Constitutional Chamber, which, in flagrant violation of the Constitution, allowed Hernandez's re-election intentions to hold on to power. The third petition is the electoral reforms, the new electoral law. If the government accepts the terms that the Libre Party is demanding before the dialogue, they will be accepting a full investigation by independent investigators on the corruption cases in which they are involved, and they will let go of their continuity project and allow a more transparent electoral process. Many assured these demands are another way to say no to the dialogue by the Libre Party, but assured that the political opposition has reasons not to believe in the good intentions of the OAS. You have to see the OAS for its background, how they've worked during the recent conflict processes in Latin America, and I believe that after what happened in Paraguay and Honduras, there is a bad impression of this organization, and in a sense that in the situation as one in Honduras is living now, if the OAS acts with the same inclination and characteristics as they did in Honduras in 2009, there is no guarantee of inclusion in the dialogue. During the crisis after the 2009 coup d'etat against President Manuel Zelaya, the OAS wasn't able to restore democracy in Honduras and instead validated the elections that the sectors behind the coup used to clean their image internationally. Zelaya's followers seem not to accept easily this time the proposal of the multinational political organism. Gerardo Torres, Telesur, Central America. And now a brief of other major breaking news stories across the globe. Protests continued in Ferguson a day after the killing of an armed black teenager, Michael Brown. Activists, relatives and protesters joined in to demand an end to racism and racial profiling by police. They also called on justice for all black people killed by white police across the United States. The protesters blocked a highway. The police responded by arresting 50 people, including various renowned activists, among which was Cornel West. Police officers were seen violently slamming a protester on the ground before arresting him. They're still killing our babies for no reason. Unarmed, uh, mental ill, incarcerated. Uh, it has to stop. Greece and its international lenders clinched a multi billion euro bailout agreement early this morning after marathon talks. Negotiation lasted over 23 hours, after which Greek officials expressed satisfaction with the agreement reached. The new pact is worth almost $95 billion in fresh loans for debt-ridden Greece. Greek officials said they expect the accord to be ratified by their parliament this Wednesday or Thursday. Greece's finance minister made a statement after the talks. Yes, there are one or two small issues, but we are almost there. Japan switched on a nuclear reactor for the first time in nearly two years and despite strong protests nationwide. Prime Minister Shinzo Abe attempted to reassure a nervous public that tougher standards mean the sector is now safe after the Fukushima disaster in 2011. That nuclear tragedy left over 160,000 people without their homes. Protesters are led by former Japanese Prime Minister Naoto Kan, who was in power when the meltdowns at the Fukushima plant caused a release of radioactive material. Abe's government is a government that will ruin the nation. The Italian Navy reported that it has rescued over 1,500 more migrants in the last 24 hours. Officials said that the Navy carried out seven separate operations. The increasing migrant numbers leaving Africa and the Middle East show the crisis is also on the rise. So far this year, 90,000 migrants have arrived in Italy by sea. About 2,000 died in their attempt for a better life. The European Union had approved an emergency fund of over $3 billion to help the region. 
mainly Italy and Greece, deal with the crisis. And of course, thanks to our news team in Quito, Ecuador, for producing the World News Package. We end our newscast on a cultural note. Former Cuban leader Fidel Castro has, was honored with a photographic exhibition in Havana ahead of his 89th birthday and the reopening of the U.S. Embassy in the Cuban capital. The exhibition features intimate and iconic portraits of the bearded revolutionary whose cigar-smoking guerrillas ousted U.S.-backed dictator Fulgencio Batista in 1959. This triggered a five-decade-plus U.S. blockade on the Caribbean nation. And as we've been reporting, relations have been improving between the two nations. The U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry is expected on August 14th to fly to the Cuban capital to officially reopen the U.S. Embassy there. For more on these and other stories, please visit our website, telesurtv.net slash English. For Telesur English, I'm Regan Devines. Have a safe and productive day.